In this video, we will talk about the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 1. So recall that in sections 5.1 and 5.2, definite integrals, we defined, we defined the signed area, the signed area under a curve. So we've we talked about ways we could find the signed area under a curve. In this section, we are going to look at the rate of change of the area function. So what this will eventually be leading up to is we're going to eventually get an easier way to compute the area under a curve. And the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is going to be a precursor to that. Okay, so recall that the rate of change, this is just the derivative. So we want to be able to talk about the derivative of this area function. So here's how we'll start that process. So I'm going to let f of t be a continuous function. on some closed interval from A to B. And I'm just going to assume that f of t is always greater than or equal to zero, just for simplicity. So this is for simplicity, and it'll make it easier for me to draw a picture. OK, so I'm going to draw a picture now. So I'm going to draw a y-axis and an x-axis. And let's say I have some curve. So this is going to be the graph of my function y equals f of t. And then I'll draw some interval from A to B. So what I want to do now is I want to define an area function. So I'm going to call this function g of x. And an area we can express as a definite integral. So I'll have a definite integral. And I'm going to go from A to some variable x. And then of my function f of t dt. So in terms of the picture, we are finding the area from A to some number x. Okay, so if I draw in that area, that is this blue shaded region. Okay, so depending on what x is, this area changes. Like looking at my picture, if x gets a little bit bigger, we have a bigger area. Okay, so this integral, this definite integral, depends on the value of x, and that's why it's a function of x. Okay, so our goal is going to be is going to be to compute the derivative of this area function. OK, so let me just label in my picture that g of x is the area under this function over the interval from a to x. So between when x is a and when x is x. OK, so well, how do I find a derivative? So let's recall from earlier in our course, there are derivative. So I'm going to use the limit definition of a derivative where h goes to 0. And we have a fraction. On the top, I'll have g of x plus h, and then minus g of x. And on the denominator, we'll have h. OK, so that was our limit definition of the derivative. OK, so I want to apply that to the area function that we have. So for this, I'm going to draw a, just another picture of my function. So I'm just going to recopy this. We have y equals f of t. And then we have a and we have b. OK. I'm also going to label x. And then we're also inputting x plus h. So I'm going to put x plus h over here as x plus a small amount. So that is going to be x plus h. All right, so looking at our limit. Let's start to evaluate this. So I'm going to focus on this numerator first. So let's focus on the g of x plus h minus g of x. And let's think about, well, what does that mean? So looking at my definition of, of g of x, g of x plus h would be the area over, well, let me just say the area on the interval. So it starts at a. And then it goes until whatever I'm plugging in. And here I'm plugging in x plus h. 
So this would be the area on the interval from A to X plus H. So that's G of X plus H. And then minus G of X, we've already seen that one. That's the area on the interval from A to X. Okay, so if I subtract those two areas, so if I look at A going all the way to where X is and then going all the way, all the way to where X plus H is, if I do the area from A to X plus H and then I subtract the area from A to X, that'll just leave us with, I'm just gonna shade it in, it'll just leave us with this tiny sliver, that shaded area. Okay, so this will just be the area on the interval from X to X plus H. So our idea is gonna be, I'm gonna estimate this area using a rectangle. Okay, so I am gonna estimate that using a rectangle. I'm gonna use left endpoint. So left endpoint would give me, this is the height of the rectangle, then I draw a horizontal line across, and then a line down, and I get this rectangle. So it's not quite my area, it's just an estimate. Okay, but the smaller H gets, the better my estimate will get. Okay, that's gonna be important. So the area I want, the shaded area, is approximately equal to the area of that rectangle that we just drew. Okay, and we know how to find the area of a rectangle. Well, it's gonna be the base times the height. So it's gonna be the base times height. Okay, and the base of that rectangle, the distance from x to x plus h, well, that distance is just h. So the base is h, and the height, because we're using left endpoints, is f of x. So we have h times f of x. So this is the numerator of our limit. The numerator, g of x plus h minus g of x, just equals h times f of x. All right, so now I'm gonna form the whole fraction. First, I'll do it without the limit in front. Okay, let me zoom it out a little bit, so thus, we'll get that g of x plus h minus g of x over the h. This will be equal to, well, actually approximately equal to because of this approximately equal sign. This is approximately equal to, the numerator is approximately equal to h times f of x. And then we get all over that h on the bottom. But here the h is gonna cancel and we just get f of x. So normally when I cancel something on the top and the bottom like I did here with the h, I would have to write this domain restriction that h is not allowed to be zero. But in this problem, because I'm taking a limit as h goes to zero, when I rem remember, when we do a limit, h just gets close to this number, but it's not allowed to be equal to it. So because h can't be equal to zero, I don't need to explicitly write that domain restriction. I don't have to worry about h being zero because of the limit. All right, so now let's actually take this limit. So we mentioned this earlier, but as h gets close to zero. So as this value h gets closer and closer to zero, the x plus h gets closer and closer to x. And as it happens, the area of the rectangle and the shaded area, they get closer and closer together. And our approximation, so as we take that limit as h approaches zero, our approximation becomes exact. All right, Ooh, let's write that better. It becomes exact. All right, so we are ready to write out our derivative with the limit. So g prime of x, remember, is the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h minus g of x over h. But we now know that as h approaches zero, this approximately equal to becomes an equal sign and we know that that simplified to f of x. So this will be equal to now, not just approximately equal to, it'll be equal to f of x. Okay, so I just recopied what we had at the top here. So what we've just done is actually prove the following result, which is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1, and I'll abbreviate that as FTC1. And it says that if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, and g of x is this definite integral from a to x of f of t dt, so g of x is this area function, 
and this is defined when x is in between a and b on that closed interval, then the derivative of g we've just shown is equal to f of x for all values of x in the open interval from a to b. So what this is saying is, if I take the derivative of this function g, and this is this area function, this definite integral, what I end up with is just that function on the inside, but the t will end up changing to an x. So equivalently, the way I could write this, when I say the derivative of g is f, this is equivalent to saying that g of x is an antiderivative, is an antiderivative of f of x. And g of x, remember, is our area function. So what we're recognizing is that there's a connection between antiderivatives and area functions, and we'll eventually use this to make it even more explicit when we get to the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Okay, so I wanna end by making a couple of quick comments. The first is, I mentioned that this is just a sketch of the proof. So why is it just a sketch of the proof and not like the whole thing? Well, the main reason for that is, I made, I made an assumption here, a key assumption that my function f of t was greater than or equal to zero for this picture. But in the theorem, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say f of t is greater than or equal to zero. It turns out this is true in general, even when my function is negative sometimes, even when it switches between being positive and negative. But I made that assumption in, in, in this sketch just so I could visualize it better. So in terms of our goals for this section, we finished goal one, giving a rough proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. In the next video, we will do some examples where we apply it.